what I'm going to do is try to situate the current situation in what um, in this situation, but not from the standpoint of any technical issues, but from the standpoint of where the will is going to come from to carry out the policies. And um, it's in that context that I, I, I think the, the G20 meeting, which was just concluded in Osaka, Japan, was a very positive development, but nothing as yet has emerged in the G20 meeting that uh, over, um, that um, guarantees the survival of humanity. What actually occurred at the G20 meeting is that the lines of communication between the heads of the key states, meaning Russia, China, India, and the United States, uh, dramatically improved and strengthened the lines of communication between the heads of state. This very important idea called the heads of state. And we'll get to that. An example of this is the joke that Trump pulled at the press conference when one of these, you know, are well, you going to tell the Russians not to meddle in U.S. elections? And he turned around and Putin and said, so, so, don't meddle in U.S. elections. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody cracked up and Putin cracked up and the beat, liberal media was went berserk. <coughs> but what's significant about this, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to quote, uh, Trump from uh, from the meeting. Okay. Uh, 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 anyhow, uh, I'm not going to quote Trump from the meeting. But basically, he was. Uh, what what it uh, what you had was that the, the U.S. president showed great respect to the Russian president. And the Russian president showed great respect to the U.S. president on a personal level and on a state to state level. This is not the media. This is not you know scolding Russia or or, or anything like that or, or being scolded. And he basically uh, said that the meeting was fantastic. It was wonderful, and that Putin is very uh, basically a great guy. You know, this is the opposite of whatever was said by Obama in, in previous, uh, as a previous president. And another example is that Trump has um, reversed the ban on Huawei. On what? On Huawei. Oh, okay. um, he's reversed the ban. No, it hasn't, he said he's going to reverse the ban. Whether he can actually deliver a reversal or not is another story. But he has reversed the ban, and, which means if it is reversed, it means that the U.S. can start buying Huawei. U.S. Uh, firms and U.S. individuals can stop uh, can start buying Huawei, and uh, of course there was significant cautiousness on the part of uh, President Xi of China and Putin because they don't know how far Trump can deliver, so they're being very cautious. Also, once he said he was going to reverse the ban, then the trade talks between Russia and China have, have, have uh, now begun uh, uh, to, to restart. And then in the middle of his visit to South Korea, Trump proposed that uh, Kim Jong-un and him uh, shake hands, and Trump walked into North Korea and hang, hang, hung around with Kim for a little bit. Uh, but unfortunately, we do not yet have the basis for durable survival at any time. Um, things could be thrown off, off, off kilter. Um, and, you know, nuclear war could break out at any time at, uh, at this point. And, and partly, one of the reasons that this could partly, is partly because the U.S. Congress in passed a bill last year that removed some of the control of the military, especially the cyber warfare and clandestine operations from direct presidential control. 
Uh, and this, this was the McCain, you know, this is the uh, McCain's party gift to humanity. Uh, so, you know, and, and an anatomy in the last several weeks in the Persian Gulf where Pompeo and Bolton asserted that Iran was behind the tanker incidents is an example of the ongoing problem of this type. Yet, other than the British government, no other government really went along with that. So that's an interesting aspect in and of itself. The people aren't going along. Other countries are not, are not going. The Japanese didn't go along with it. You know, a lot of other governments didn't go along with that. And we have the French president, you know. <laughs> I am Joke. the new Napoleon, and I want to see where, I want to take charge. I want to take charge. So now, the new Napoleon, who was very critical of Putin, is now saying, we need a new architecture with Russia. Uh, so, whatever that means. So, but he's, he's obviously sensing that, that, that the, the wind is blowing in a different direction. The wind is blowing in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that um, there was a parliamentarian meeting, and Russia was allowed back into the into the uh, parliamentarian meeting of Europe. And the Ukrainians and the British walked out. Uh, in other words, there's now calls by the business community throughout Europe, especially Germany, to end the sanctions on Russia. Let's get business going. And Trump's primary, not what I, should, I was going to read this, but Trump's primary thing that he said, now that I remember, is we, we don't do a lot of business with Russia. We need to do business with Russia. They can be very profitable. They have a lot of this and they have a lot of that. You know, we need to do business. That was his big thing, was we need to do business with Russia. Well, what he's doing is he's telling all the, 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 the business community that, hey, let's, let's do business with Russia. This is a great opportunity for all of you businessmen. You know, so that was his flank to the neocons and the neoliberals and everything else. Let's do business. So that's interesting. Anyhow, but this shift away from the brink is not a durable nor is it their basis yet for the collective action of those major nations to deal with the most serious problems like the city of London system, or like implementing a global glass steel, steel, which is going to have to be done. But things have moved to greater potential overall in this direction. Now, that's my introduction. Now, I want to communicate how, why I say that and how this works. I'll start with the strange experience of me trying to watch the second Democratic Party debate last night. Um, what a disaster. I only got, I got, you know, I, I got about 20 minutes in. That was pretty, that was pretty good. But then I had this, I had this desire. I didn't want to, but I had this desire to turn it off. <laughs> but I really didn't want to. I wanted to watch the whole two hours, but it, it was, I had this problem. I, I just, I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> now, these two debates are very telling, not in any positive signs, except for Tulsi Gabbard's intervention yeah. in the first debate, which was the first inkling of anything real in the debates. She forcibly indicted the establishment and their flunkies running, in effect, for their trillion, trillions and trillions of dollars of regime change war in Andres and the, and the threat of war that they created. If she makes it to the second tier of debates, she will force reality into the democratic race and challenge, at least in part, the farce of the democratic candidates and their uh, orientation and, and, and the nice little party. And, and, and then you'll have the same, potentially the same kind of fracturing going on in the democratic party that occurred in the Republican Party when Trump came in. Other than Tulsi, you had a debate on taxing the rich, not taxing the rich as much. Who was most into climate change? Uh, who, who had the best single-payer health care solution? And who spoke the best Spanish? And who was best at attacking Trump? And who was best at being anti-China and anti-Russia? Or who was not best? And, you know, and who was most for open borders? Who was most for gender politics? 
And you have to ask yourself, what is going on in these people's heads? Do they not know that the majority of the U.S. population see them as uh, somewhat farcical? I suspect they don't. Honestly, I suspect they do not see themselves as being farcical. They're so caught up in this moment. They are only seeing themselves in a triangulated way of positioning themselves and posturing themselves within the given issues that have been presented in the media. That's reality. That's all reality is to these people. And um, uh, the only real exceptions to that besides, in my view, besides Tulsi was a little bit of Bernie Sanders who was, you know, like a, like a clock that, that hits the same note every time, you know. <laughs> And, and Joe Biden wasn't there. He was sort of off in Greenland. And I couldn't figure out where, where he was at all. Maybe he was somewhere else. I don't know. Maybe he, was, he had been inducted by aliens. I have no idea where his mind was. But anyhow, now, it's in this context that I want to quote Putin. Uh, because I think this is very important. But it's not very strong. He's not being very strong. He's, he's being very mild in what he's saying. But, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's very good. What is happening in the West? This is, okay, this is in a, in a London Times, uh, London Financial Times interview. And what is happening in the West? What is the reason for the Trump phenomenon, as you said, in the United States? What is happening in Europe as well? The ruling elites have broken away from the people. The obvious problem is the gap between the interests of the elite and the uh, overwhelming majority of the people. There's also the so-called liberal idea, which has outlived its purpose. Our Western partners have submitted that so, have admitted that some elements of the liberal ideas, such as multiculturalism, are no longer tenable. When the migration problem came to a head, many people admitted that the policy of multiculturalism is not effective and that the interests of the core population should be considered. So he's talking about that particular aspect of it, but it, it applies to everything. And then uh, later he says, Later he says, later he talks about relations with the U.S. and so forth. But he's, he's, he's basically uh, opening up the, the dialogue or debate on the issue of liberalism. And he's doing it in a very sort of cautious sort of way that the liberal order doesn't work. Uh, Russia has been accused, and strange as it may seem, it is still being accused, despite the Mueller report, of mythical interference in the U.S. election. What happened in reality, Mr. Trump looked into his opponent's attitude to him and saw changes in American society, and he took advantage of this. You and I are talking ahead of the G20 meeting. It is an economic forum, and it will be undoubtedly have discussions on globalization, global trade, and international finance. Has anyone ever given a thought to the act who actually benefited and what benefits were gained from globalization, the development of which we have been observing and participating in over the last past 25 years, since the 1990s? China has made use of globalization in particular to pull millions of Chinese out of poverty. What happened in the United States and how did it happen? In the United States, the leading U.S. companies, the companies their managers, their show, shareholders and partners made use of these benefits. The middle class hardly benefited from globalization. The take home pay in the US, etc. The middle class in the United States has not benefited from globalization and was left out where this pie was divided up. The Trump team sensed this very keenly and clearly and they used this in the election campaign. It is where you should look for reasons behind Trump victory rather than in any alleged foreign interference. This is what we should be talking about here, including when it comes 
to global, the global economy. I believe this may explain his seemingly extravagant economic decisions and even his relations with his partners and allies. He believes that the distribution of resources and benefits of globalization in the past decade were unfair to the United States. I'm not going to discuss whether it was fair or not, and I will not say if he was doing the right or wrong. I would like to understand his motives, which is what you asked me about. So this is uh, this is in the Financial Times. Now, I, what what Putin is getting at is a fundamental issue, uh, and he's being very mild about it. Okay, the fundamental issue of what's really happened to the world under globalization. And he's explaining the reasons for why Trump is, so he's, he's, in, he's indicating an understanding of where Trump is going and coming from, which is the issue that he has to deal with, which President Xi has to deal with, and, and, and so forth. So now I want to go into this issue of liberalism, because I think, I think we're, 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 we're still starting with the was a good point on liberalism, but I wanted, I wanted to go into that. My first experience with this issue of liberalism came from reading a, a mildly pornographic um, biography of a, of a guy by the name of Frank Harris. It was called My Life in Love. So I was very young. I might have been 12 or 13 years old. And in the book, in describing his exploits or whatever, he, he discusses his early Early, uh, he came over from Ireland at the age of 14. He ended up studying law. He did a lot of things. He ended up studying law, and then he was converted to liberalism. And he rejected the idea of the nation state and went back to Britain and became a, a, a writer and a, and, a, and a journalist and a very prominent journalist, uh, discussing, you know, interviewing all the top people and so forth, and writing articles on it and so forth. And he was a complete degenerate. But what I do remember in the book is his, is his discussion of why he became a liberal. And it was because, in his mind, you know, it was about him. It was about his, you know, he. It's about him. It's about his person. And that liberalism was the, was, was, was the way the world should be. And there, there are people who make it and there are people who don't and so forth and so on. And I, that was my first experience with this issue of, of liberalism was when I was reading the wrong kind of books, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so what is liberalism? It is first and foremost a rejection of the idea of the nation state, of the sovereign nation. Uh, liberalism is comes after the creation of the, of the modern nation, and it's an attack on the modern nation. And the, the idea of the modern nation exists in the context of natural law, as was developed in the Renaissance, of a lawful, natural lawful universe where if you do not, um, if you do not act for the general welfare, or you do not act in the, in the interest of the good, which is the issue of St. Augustine originally, uh, then you are going to collapse. So the idea of the Renaissance it was this idea of natural law. And, and in the modern sense, in economics, liberalism is rejection of the notion uh, of, of, of the nation and the rejection of the notion of of uh, natural law for the ideology of laissez-faire and the magic of the marketplace. This is a rejection of Hamilton who who created, was the principal creator of the institution of the presidency which exists for the, for the standpoint of using the nation as the vehicle for the future. Marx is, uh, the problem with Marx, he does not have a, a conception of a nation, he has a conception of class class conflict, but he doesn't really have a very developed conception of a nation. It is the philosophy, in philosophy, it is the, it is the idea that truth is relative. God is unknowable. God, whether God or not exists is a matter of taste or opinion. It is also simultaneous in philosophy of the magic of the marketplace. Uh, 
that if you don't, if you're not uh, operating on the basis of the principle of the nation, then you'd have no vehicle so, to deal with the problems, and and and. And if you have no vehicle to deal with the problems, you have no, no vehicle to actually have progress. And from this it follows that there is no future solution to scarce resources. Thus liberalism implies the Malthusian idea that populations increase at a greater rate than the physical economy increases. Because you have no vehicle to increase the physical economy. Because you can't organize the increase of the physical economy. Because you're not a nation. And, and when this applies to human and economic reproduction, in culture it is the concept of a universal common good. In culture, the concept of a universal common good or even a universal knowable conception of beauty is rejected, asserting that this is tyranny. Under liberalism, your allegiance is not to the future of a nation, but only to yourself. Poverty is not response is not your responsibility unless you feel Terrible, or sympathy for the poor, and that's only you know an, an ameliorative uh, uh, thing. The best you can do is maximize pleasure and minimize pain. A liberal world order is the end of nations. Liberal democracy is the code word for the end of history. The end of history is the end of nations. And, they, and this guy Fukuyama even wrote a book about that. So, <coughs> so. It's in that context that you should examine the, the, what's going on at the G20 meeting. What did you have? You have the establishment of a formal three-nation dialogue of heads of state, Russia, China, and India. That took place at the G20. And that, that dialogue is supposed to be extended now to the future, that Russia, China, and India should be discussing their fundamental mutual problems and so on and so on. That has not existed. This was originally proposed by LaRouche, and originally before that, and after that, was proposed by Primakov uh, in, 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 in Russia, who temporarily was the prime minister of Russia. And so that is, that is a big breakthrough, to have those three countries collaborate in this way, in a dialogue. And why in a dialogue? Because they are rep their leaders represent the nation. They represent the nation. So this is the resurgence of nations, and I don't mean nationalism. I mean of actual power of nations, not you know some some football you know kind of thing of you know my my country you know blah blah blah. But but some actual sense of the power that nations could wield in the future. And. So it's out of the constitutional battle that Hamilton fought against the slave interest came the creation of the U.S. presidency. Today, the Hamiltonian presidency is actually, in reality, Lyndon LaRouche. And I'll explain that. This is understood by our enemies and our friends. This is the intervention that was done in the late 70s and, early, and late, into the late 80s that put the American system back into the spotlight, put the SDI there, put the, put the whole, all of the policies of economic development that are going on in the world. This was revived by LaRouche under his presidential campaigns as uh, an extension of the principle of a Hamiltonian presidency. And that principle is now operative uh, because people like Dr. Donald Trump and people like uh, Roger Stone and so forth were in that milieu around Ronald Reagan who were experiencing this this shift that was that was going on in the Reagan administration around of course Reagan was in, was not unable to to deal with it but this is the fury with which LaRouche came under attack was because he had succeeded in reviving this Hamiltonian presidency which includes the American system, FDR, Lincoln, Kennedy, and so forth. So, so this is where where the it's, and if you if you if you have an institution, a functioning institution of the presidency, it's going to go in that direction because those ideas are already there. Those ideas are embedded in many of the people who who have not 
who are not willing to raise their, their head because of the environment, the witch the witch hunt like environment, but it's all there. And and so this issue of nations is that the leader or executive or king or prince or whatever is responsible to the general welfare of the all the people. This concept is rejected by liberals. You're only responsible for yourself. In the British Empire, you have a British parliamentary system and their echoes throughout the, the, the former colonies, the current colonies. And it's a, different, it's a different system of government. No one is responsible for the general welfare. At best, one is responsible to no one but oneself, and, or a, one is responsible to the crown, the emperor, or whatever. Whatever, whether it's the city of London under the crown or the British military intelligence is responsible to the crown, you are not responsible for the welfare of Canada. You are not responsible for the welfare of the United Kingdom. You are not responsible for the welfare. You are not responsible. Somebody else is responsible. Uh, thus, no one makes policy. You don't make. You can't make policy unless you have a, a sense of of the whole and what is what is in the interest of the whole. You can't make policy. You just what you're doing is 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 acrobatic activity in terms of what is considered to be the issues. Yes. So so policy comes down from the top to the compartments. With parliamentary party discipline controlling the appearance of a democratically elected body, but it's the it's the leadership in the parliament that uh, that has a tight control over the parties. The people voted for Brexit, but Brexit hasn't happened. I mean that's kind of a dumb example, but so the system of empire is always seeking to find ways to create mediating structures outside of, of nations or the threat of nations. So they're attacking nations by creating external or internal structures that are not um, like those structures that are organized criminal structures or NGOs or financial structures or agreements to submit nations to a set of rules like the European Union, NAFTA, and WTO, globalization. The promotion of liberalism is the undermining and also the misdirecting the negative response to liberalism as well. So there's, a, there's also an attack on liberalism coming from all kinds of quarters, but it's not properly informed. You know, so it's, 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 it tends to be psychotic and, and, and it can be misdirected for the lack of understanding that the people uh, who, are, who are being misdirected have. So, um, hang on a second. Okay. Now, um, so the reason I'm saying this is that Putin, in his in his very mild way, is addressing this question, and the fact that he's addressing this question because he's very conservative means that this is the issue that is now emerging in the minds of leadership. This neoliberal, this neoliberal system is the issue. It's not just, it's not just this country or that country, but it's a worldview that's the problem. It's not, it's not just this or that, but it's an actual belief in a worldview. It's a worldview. And that, that worldview doesn't work. And of course that those who hold that worldview are screaming bloody murder about Xi Jinping being a tyrant, uh, Putin being a tyrant, uh, Trump being a this and that, uh, and all of that, because because they embody, even imperfectly, the impulse of, of a nation, which is not, you know, again, just some idea of my nation, but it's a, it's a, it's a principle of power that is going to be needed and can only, through these nations, could you actually have a resolution to the crisis, could you have them deal with the financial collapse? Could you have them deal with the drug trade? Could you have them deal with with uh, stopping these other forces from getting us into world into world war? Now, 
This is not the only place where the attack on liberalism is coming from. Uh, this is somewhat shocking, um, and I'm going to go through this. The former Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, wrote an essay explaining why the Church has descended into uh, pedophilia and other other problems, why they become so prominent in, in the Church. And what he did was very interesting. And I keep coming back to this time and time again because uh, this Pope, um, uh, who we knew as Cardinal Ratzinger, was very close to the earlier Pope, John Paul II, who was fighting liberalism from within the church, but, the, uh, but he got very sick. And, but back in, back in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s, uh, uh, LaRouche was brought into the Vatican and actually gave a class in economics. And he developed uh, the triple curve function for, for this purpose. Okay. This is the physical economy. This is the increasing financial assets. Okay, this is uh, uh, and and this is the increase of, uh, of credit. I mean, I'm not sure. I can't remember. It's been a while. But he introduced this idea of, of a collapse function, of a triple curve collapse function, and to the Vatican. So we were in a dialogue with the leadership of the church over the fact that their approach, that they needed to intervene from a theological, religious standpoint in favor of the development of third world countries and so on and so forth. Now, Cardinal Ratzinger, later Benedict XVI, he wrote an article for our, uh, our, our culture magazine, the Fidelity. And so, so, you know, we didn't hear very much from him, but he wrote this essay. And this essay, I keep coming back to this essay because what he explains in this essay is how theologically, liberalism transformed the church. And, um, and so, uh, and the way it works is this. Um, I'm trying to find my page. I'm missing the page. Um, okay, well, I must Oh, here, it must, I must have gone. Okay, I got it right here. Okay. He started off by saying that the sexual revolution of the 1960s going into the 70s uh, heavily impacted the recruitment of the next generation of priests. But the core theological problem goes back to Vatican II which began an exhaustive effort to find a, in, in, in the actual scriptures themselves, the New Testament, we're talking about the New Testament now, the basis for natural law. That is, is there in the scriptures a, 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 a uh, the basis for natural law. And the way he said in the past was that this concept of natural law existed and then you would you would you would back it up with scriptures, but you wouldn't go to the scriptures to try to find the definitive, the, the, you know, the def as the deciding point in in whether natural law existed. And this was this whole thing became all consuming, and it ended up that they couldn't find any scriptural basis to 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 codify the existence of natural law. Well, you wouldn't necessarily do that because, because writing is, is, an idea is not, is not something that you can write. It has, it has outside, it's, it's how you interpret, it's, it, and so forth. So what happened was by the end of this whole process leading into the, the, um, the 80s, the, the church, 
the vast majority of the theologians in the church were convinced that there was no basis for natural law in scriptures. And they began to move into a concept of, of a situational uh, basis. And so they went from, a situa from an idea of, of, a, of natural law and violating natural law is, doesn't work to an idea that there is good and evil are relative. Evil can be good in certain situations. There is no absolute evil, nor is there absolute good. And so that became the, 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 the theological basis for the, for the demoralization of the church, and they're adopting a liberal view that is totally relativistic, depending upon the situation. And then, uh, so you began to have the, the, the there is no basis for for you to say to a priest that it's absolutely wrong what you're doing. It's situational. It's, it's it, and this is what he's saying. I mean, this is what this, a former pope is actually saying this in this thing. I'm like completely blown away. He's saying this: the church is 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 lost its way completely because it's not just about sexual abuse. It goes deeper into the theological liberalism which took over the church because they, they rejected natural law. They rejected a principle of truth. They reject, rejected a principle of a, of, a, of, a, of a universe. And so the same thing that's been going on outside of the church finally took over the church and that's where the, the new pope is. The pope Francis is in that position. And what he's saying is that uh, what he's saying is that those in the church have to revive that spirit of a universal love and a, and a, and a, and a universal uh, sense of truth and so forth and so on. And he says it in his own way, but it's very stark. It's very, uh, it, 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 it paints a picture of, uh, of a dying institution, which he doesn't want to see die. So he is calling upon those in the church to separate themselves from this evil that has taken over the church and begin to revive a, a church, but not from the outside, but from the inside. So again, again, this is, a similar uh, reflection on the part of a, 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 a similar reflection. But he's part of the evil. Huh? Jesus himself is part of the evil. What? Well, Personification of evil. Who? The current pope. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about the current pope. I'm oh. talking about Benedict. Okay. But he's basically saying that. And, of course, it's dedicated to Pope Francis and so forth and so on. Right. But why am I saying this? Because the tide is starting to turn against this whole liberalism. It's very important, and it's on the basis of that, that these nations can come together and actually implement something. Because otherwise, they can't implement anything. There is no cohesion. There is no, uh, there is no coherence. There's nothing. And it has to come from that power that resides in the nation and its head of state. And that is why the Purusha has been saying for so long that these, these nations and their heads of state have to come together to deal with the crisis that the, that the world is facing. So, so it's in that context that a potential vehicle for dealing with these things is going is, is potential. So this is this this is spreading. And Putin's comments are indicative of the growing awareness. That the problem is not just, you know, geopolitics. Yeah, geopolitics is a problem, but it's deeper. There's a deeper problem, which is liberalism. <laughs> and, that, and that's very important because that's the beginning of our, of, of our being able to, to go all out on, on, on a deeper level with people. And it's also coherent with how increasingly the general population will regard the democratic base as a farce. So I'm going to stop there. Okay. All right, so I got kind of got 
got away from me there.